So uh, welcome to you all to this event by the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It's Solutions Day here at COP27, and we're pleased to showcase our sustainable infrastructure investments and the climate features of these. So um, let me just use the ticker to move through the slides. I just wanted to say that uh, first we'll make an introduction and then it will be followed by questions that I will pose to our investment operations colleagues here and one of our clients. Um, and so what we're really trying to do here is show our whole of bank approach to what we're doing on climate. And so first a little bit about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. We're a multilateral development bank so born soon after the Paris Agreement. And we have a global membership. And we, as this slide shows, it, it gives you a good idea about the fact that we're covering several different developing countries and also developed countries. And our priorities are around four areas of financing infrastructure for tomorrow, uh, green infrastructure, connectivity, and regional cooperation technology enabled, and we look at unlocking new capital. So I think you may have heard also about our approach being fundamentally lean, uh, green, clean and green. And so our approach to investments and our focus is on things, approaches where there's new innovative financing structures, but we also work through partnerships and, and platforms. And the four um, areas of um, sectors that we focus on, which we'll be covering as well today, are water, urban, energy, transport, and digital infrastructure. And the other aspect of what uh, AIB uh, does and is in its corporate strategy is to be agile and adaptable, and the bank will meet clients' needs and operate to the highest standards. And now I'll come to the point where, my name is Saliha Lockwood. I'm in the climate strategy, uh, I'm in the climate team at uh, AIB in the strategy policy team. And we set out ambitious climate commitments for the bank or, and uh, it's uh, set out publicly that we would have at least 50% share of climate finance and actual financing approvals by 20. 25 and full Paris alignment by 1st July 2023. And we're already carrying out Paris alignment actions by ensuring the joint MDB framework is used, uh, in which criteria are set out on mitigation and adaptation. On every project, we need to do a vulnerability assessment. And as a result, I think many projects are looking at adding adaptation and resilience features so we also work with other MDBs to learn from their experience. And then what we've experienced from 2020 to 21 is that we've achieved a doubling of our climate finance to 2.8 billion with 48% of our total financing approvals being climate finance. And our adaptation finance tripled over this period. So at COP, we brought three messages uh, one which is about mobilizing finance uh, and partnering with others. Um, so uh, we'll touch upon some of those partnerships. Uh, Toshi Fumi in particular from the energy sector will be talking a bit about that. And technology as a key solution on climate um, and adaptation and resilience through the, the capital uh, market. So I'm going to move to introducing you to the, the panelists and then to, to start off with questions. So Toshiaki Kai, uh, Kaicho, uh, first here on, on the left, will be um, speaking on investments in the urban and water sector, focused on mitigation adaptation and including results-based lending examples. We have Anne Lopez, who will sp be speaking on transport and climate resilience. Toshifumi Kazaoka, speaking on the energy sector and renewable energy, uh, as well as about partnerships, as I mentioned, and Francisco Fortuni on financial intermediaries on lending to local financing institutions. And this is a really promising approach for creating 
local financial sustainability, which is a critical topic for COP. And this will be followed, uh, most importantly, with an intervention by our client, Selen Antman, uh, from TSKB, Tur Turkey's first private development and investment bank. And we'll hear about this particular financial um, intermediary on lending. So um, let me start with the, the questions. So um, Toshiaki, uh, in terms of cities worldwide, they're the main contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and urban populations are seriously getting affected by extreme weather events. Um, I know you're covering urban and water sectors. Uh, if you could give us some specific project examples of what AI has been able to do in this space uh, with regard to climate finance. Thank you very much, Saleha. Um, yes, cities are responsible for 70 to 75 percent of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and if you look into uh, uh, different subsectors within cities, for example, uh, buildings are responsible for 60 percent, transport 30 percent, and waste management 10 percent, just roughly uh, uh, responsible for uh, green greenhouse gas emissions. So you need a different types of interventions if you talk about uh, urban development in cities. And uh, on the water side, uh, climate change is uh, leading to uh, sometimes too much water in terms of, in terms of rainfalls and uh, floods, or too little water in terms of drought. Um, in addressing this, AIB is financing uh, uh, various projects, both on mitigation and adaptation. Uh, so far, this slide shows um, um, our board approved 6.5 billion US dollars of financings in, in my sector, urban and water sectors. Let me try to uh, quickly introduce some of the uh, uh, projects. So the first one is Istanbul Seismic Risk Mitigation and Emergency Preparedness Project in Turkey. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite projects. And uh, the project is retrofitting hundreds of public buildings, such as schools and hospitals in Istanbul. As you know, Istanbul has a serious uh, seismic risks. And uh, at the same time, uh, 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 the, well the first objective of this project is to make the buildings uh, uh, more resilient against earthquakes. But second objective is to make those buildings greener and more energy efficient. So mitigation uh, aspects come here. So I think everybody agrees that um, if you do retrofitting of buildings for structural uh, strengthening against earthquakes, it also makes sense to uh, make them greener to improve energy efficiency of the same buildings at the same time. So we are uh, targeting uh, uh, two objectives here. So uh, in terms of mitigation and uh, design features of energy efficiency, uh, this project is uh, adapting uh, some of these features, such as uh, thermal insulation, uh, energy efficient windows and doors, and energy efficient lighting systems, like lighting bulbs and uh, automatic lighting sensors, and also rooftop uh, solar panels whenever it's possible. As I mentioned, uh, buildings are responsible for a lot of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in cities. So I think we should do more of this type of projects to improve energy efficiency of cities. So my second project is the um, Greater Mare Waste Energy Project in the Maldives. As you know, um, the Maldives is facing serious solid waste management problem. Uh, open dumping and occasional burning of garbage uh, are happening. And uh, in fact, in the designated island called T Tilafushi, uh, there's a huge mountain of garbage uh, uh, polluting air, land, and sea of otherwise beautiful Maldives. So this project is uh, actually changing that situation uh, uh, by uh, 
helping construct a uh, regional uh, wastewater treatment plant. And uh, this is turning the garbage into energy, generating electricity not only to cover the plant operations, but also surplus of eight to 10 megawatt of uh, uh, electricity, uh, which is reducing uh, energy demands for uh, diesels and fossil fuels. On adaptation side, uh, the project uh, uh, is adapting climate resilient features such as elevated floors and uh, flood proof mechanical and equi uh, electrical equipment, uh, en enhanced drainage system and vegetations to shield the plant from uh, winds and the heat. So let me turn to the next project. This is uh, Metro Manila flood management project in the Philippines. So this project is rehabilitating and upgrading the urban drainage systems in Metro Manila. And this is designed for uh, higher rainfall intensity and rising sea level caused by uh, climate change. This is for climate adaptation, obviously. So in fact, uh, uh, we are getting more and more request from our borrowing uh, uh, members for this kind of flood uh, control, flood management uh, projects. So my last project is Resilient Kerala uh, program in India. We are co-financing this program with World Bank, uh, French, AFD, and Germans, KFW. So a lot of partnership uh, uh, around this program. As you know that the state of Kerala in, in southern India is uh, vulnerable to uh, climate change and natural disasters as they experienced uh, serious floods in the recent past. So the program was designed to uh, make the state of Kerala more resilient against climate change and natural disasters. And in, in fact, this progr program is very unique in, in two aspects. One is this program covers uh, multiple sectors, uh, including urban development, uh, roads, and flood control, uh, and others. And the most important aspect of this uh, program is, is that this is results-based lending. Under the uh, normal projects, we are dispersing against contracts of civil works uh, or procurement of equipment or uh, consultancy services. However, this program is disbursing uh, our funds against the results achieved. For example, uh, the number of urban master plans uh, incorporating climate risks or uh, kilometers of climate resilient roads rehabilitated or constructed. And also the number of flood management features uh, 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 constructed or installed, such as uh, early, uh, early warning uh, systems for flood. So uh, these are some of the uh, projects we are financing uh, for climate uh, mitigation and adaptation uh, for urban and water sectors. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Toshiaki. Uh, great to uh, see what we're doing in the urban and uh, water sectors and different approaches that we're taking and trying to work with with clients um, uh, on this to uh, ex expand um, uh, and provide uh, impacts as well. Um, so uh, on in the transport area, and uh, so we're we're focusing. Uh, I understand a lot on climate resilience and how is. AIB supporting climate resilience in the transport sector. Thank you, Saleha. Can you hear me? Yeah. So over the past two weeks here at COP27, we have heard over and over again that the urgency of climate agenda is very critical, not just for one country as well as for one sector, but for all countries and all sectors. This is no different for the transport sector because the urgency to decarbonize in the transport sector is quite critical. Um, the transport sector is a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, contributing about 20 to 25 percent. 
majority of this comes from the road sector at about 75%, followed by um, ports and airports at about 10% apiece, as well as uh, railways at about um, 1%. So the impacts of global emissions are profound as this results to a warmer world. And for roads that are not climate adapted, a warmer world can have dire consequences. For example, flooding is more likely to result to road washouts. Extreme precipitation and flooding can also cause soil erosion, which hinders um, road access. When there is lack of road access, this also hinders the access to social and economic opportunities for people who need them the most. So transport infrastructure, in a sense, also can save lives because a climate-proof transport infrastructure can serve as a refuge during uh, huge climatic events. So in this context, AIB is supporting its member countries develop climate resilient infrastructure to become future ready. Um, in fact, we have a track record since its exemption um, of providing support of over 6 billion USD of transport sector financing, many of which have climate resilience um, elements. So how does AIB provide support in this sector? So from a project level um, perspective, promoting climate resilience requires a methodological approach within the context of government's national plans on climate change. First, by helping countries um, identify physical climate risk. Second, by incorporating recommended measures along the project development cycle, including the project design. And finally, by making sure that these measures are actually incorporated into the projects. Um, this can be ensured, for example, by including a climate resilience indicator as part of the project's monitoring framework. So with this, I will give you a couple of examples in the transport sector. So in Lao PDR, for example, AIB is supporting the rehabilitation and maintenance of a 78-kilometer road section that is part of a wider um, road corridor that connects Lao with China as well as um, Cambodia, essentially providing a cross-border connectivity element in this project. So Lao PDR is highly vulnerable to climate and disaster risk. Annual losses from adverse climatic events range between 3 to 4% of GDP, which is pretty high. The project team supported the government in the identification of recommended measures to address climatic events. Um, recommended measures related to flooding, for example, which is a climate risk in the project area, is to enhance drainage systems, provide river bank protection as well as erosion protection, and designing bridges in such a way that, that accommodates expected future flood levels. And to make sure that these recommended measures are incorporated into the project designs, the government and the project team agreed to include an output indicator in the, in the, in the project uh, monitoring framework. And AIB is supporting um, countries in a similar manner in the railway sector. In India, for example, AIB is supporting the construction of a new corridor as part of the Chennai metro system. And Chennai metropolitan area is quite prone to earthquakes, um, cyclones, as well as some areas being susceptible to flooding during heavy storms. Um, some of the measures that the project team identified with the client was to install uh, floodgates at stations, uh, rainwater harvesting structures, as well as solar panels to reduce the dependence on grid, um, grid generated um, electricity. And to raise awareness on environmental awareness, the, the project will also provide dedicated spaces for bicycles as well as other uh, green vehicles. And last but not least, um, I I'm giving an example in China where the project is facilitating cross-border trade between China um, and Europe by um, essentially by expanding the logistics hub to provide uh, more seamless services as part of the freight railway um, network by expanding logistics hubs. This facilitates further modal shift from a more carbon intensive transport, such as air and uh, marine, to a less carbon intensive one, such as uh, railways. The project will also contribute to greenhouse gas emissions reduction because of efficient design in uh, the cold chain facilities, which is part of the uh, project. So these are just a few examples that AIB is supporting countries with when it comes to climate resilience in the transport sector. We are also preparing projects in India, Pakistan, the Philippines, um, etc. 
Um, I conclude by saying that AIB is supporting climate resilience in the transport sector um, in twofold. First, by helping countries maximize climate resilience for every dollar spent. And second, by helping countries transition from a commitment mindset to actually implementing climate resilience um, within the context of a project. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anne. And now we come to the uh, important sector of energy, <laughs> where a large part of uh, the emissions are. And it's um, said that uh, energy sector is counts really for three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions. I know AIB is actively supporting renewable energy projects. Uh, but we're also supporting the energy transition. So if you could give us some specific examples from the past on renewables, but also on energy transition. And I understood you would also be informing us about the partnerships that we've moved forward with. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Seleha. Um, uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. So yes, um, the energy sector is a major contributor of GHG gas emission. And again, we have been actively supporting the renewable projects uh, in the region. I would like to first explain uh, the, the overall uh, portfolio of energy sector in AIIB. So far, we have approved um, around 6.6 .6 billion US dollars of energy project. And out of 6.6 .6 billion, around 3 billion is a climate finance. So it means uh, almost uh, half of the, our finance to the, to the energy space is actually a climate finance. And in this slide, you see some of the energy projects uh, we've approved so far. For example, uh, we have financed solar project in Oman and India, and also hydropower project in Nepal. Um, out of these projects, uh, I'd like to introduce a wind farm project in Kazakhstan. Um, this is a 100 megawatt uh, wind farm project in Kazakhstan we approved in 2019. I pick up this project uh, because first, uh, this is the largest wind farm project in Kazakhstan. And the project is strongly supporting the country's energy transition from coal to renewables. And also, this project is a good example of working together with other MDBs. Uh, as you see, we co-finance uh, with EBRD, as EBRD uh, has a huge presence in the region. And I also want to highlight that we also co-finance with Green Climate Fund, or GCF, uh, and they actually provided a concessional loan to the project. And we actually see a, a lot of uh, project, especially in energy sector, uh, financed by MDBs through blended finance. Uh, to, 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 to address the, uh, the bankability issues. So uh, with regard to your question about how we, we, we promote the energy transition, I think uh, blended finance is, um, is going to be an important tool, uh, especially in the country where the renewable energy market is not yet matured. Or some of the uh, uh, specific uh, risk uh, prevent private sector from investing in, in, in the renewable space. So uh, in this regard, um, as you may be aware, during COP27, uh, we, we announced that uh, AIB signed an agreement with Global Energy Alliance for, for People and Planet, and also uh, Energy Transition Accelerator Financing Platform, or ETAP. One of the purposes of this partnership is, is that we will have an access to the concessional resources uh, for the facilitation of energy transition in, in developing countries. So we are now happy to think about, about the innovative financing structure by strategically utilizing the concessional resources to support the creation of the new market and also mobilize the private capital to mitigate the specific uh, project risk and make the project bankable. And in addition to the blended finance, 
Um, when it comes to the energy sector, we gradually see many cross-border renewable projects, especially in Southeast Asia. And we have been actively engaging in these projects. As you can imagine, the cross-border project is, is complex in terms of uh, contract structure and ENS, uh, environment and social due diligence. And it is often the case that the two or more governments are heavily involved in a project. So uh, I, I think that uh, MDBs like ourselves is quite important in terms of uh, making the project successful, successful and in, in terms of giving the comfort to the private sector uh, or commercial banks. And I also want to emphasize that the, that the project cost of the cross-border transaction tends to be so, uh, is, is huge. So um, in some cases, uh, because in some cases, some of the, uh, the project scope includes a submarine transmission line. Um, so I, I think that the joint effort among MDBs uh, is, uh, is a key to, to make the project successful. In this regard, we are, we are also happy to, to support this cross-border renewable project uh, by, through the cooperation with other MDBs. Probably I'll stop here, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so three speakers have spoken about direct investments, and now we're going to move to the aspect of our work, which is, in this case, uh, financing a local uh, financial institution. And I'm, I'm happy to pass over to Francisco and, uh, um, and also to, to basically provide a little bit more information about this particular type of investment that's been made. Uh, and then I'll, I'll pass over to you, but go ahead. Thank you very much, Sir Saleha, and thank you very much, everyone, for participating in this seminar today. The topic of my uh, presentation is going to be financial intermediaries. We have a very substantial amount of intermediated financing. We don't do all the projects that we have described uh, before uh, just on our own. We also rely on local partners that have a lot of knowledge of the individual context of each country to help us in this task, to become the vehicles and the instruments of uh, the energy transition, climate mitigation, climate adaptation. So this is a very important part of our business and our value proposition. We also work a lot with equity funds, but it's a different type of investment. What we are going to cover today is FI institutions where we can promote uh, impact at scale through financial intermediaries, through intermediated on lending, basically. And we have done both. We have done private sector on lending, credit lines. We have also worked a lot with national development banks. These are institutions that have decades of experience in the markets where they operate. They know their markets very well. They know the clients. They have a local presence, boots on the ground, specialists, people who can uh, execute transactions quickly and in a safe way uh, w with due regard to safeguards as if these projects were done by uh, our bank, uh, um, our own bank. This is a very important premise of our work with financial intermediaries. They have to act as an extension of the same operations that we have described before and be able to execute them in much the same way we would do had we been involved ourselves. That means there is a certain element of delegation of authority, there is a certain element of uh, delegation based on trust, based on experience, based on us getting comfort from the track record of these institutions. So examples of national banks include uh, very recently, for example, BDMG in Brazil. That was one of our first Latin American projects. We also worked with other partners uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in Egypt, for example, that is National Bank of Egypt. But we have two key partners that have helped us uh, in the last years shape our uh, intervention in Turkey in particular, in the Republic of Turkey. These are TSKB and TKYB. These are two partners with whom we have done a very substantial volume and today they are the largest financial institution exposures uh, in our portfolio. 
uh, maybe it's worth to zoom in and have a quick look at the first facility, first DeFi facility that we did, in particular with TSKB. That was in 2018. It was our first FI on lending project. We didn't know how to do FI on lending at that time, so we had to find the best partner we could around to uh, implement our first facility. We were approached by TSKB, <coughs> apologies, uh, by TSKB and TKYB, who were uh, already uh, established in the market and had, in the case of TSKB, the decades of experience uh, um, operating in this, uh, in this context, plus the support of several IFIs. So we did our first facility, which was 200 million uh, on lending uh, under sovereign bank guarantee. That gave a lot of flexibility to TSKB to pursue uh, investments within a sandbox approach where we had uh, defined certain parameters of what we wanted to invest in, the type of sectors we wanted to uh, intervene. It was a rather open um, uh, set of criteria and it resulted in several seizable but at the same time granular projects that we could uh, uh, support uh, through, uh, through this intermediated form of financing. So it's essentially four wind farm, two geothermal projects, one energy efficiency project and one um, electricity distribution network. In total, 480 megawatts of installed capacity have been supported through this project. It's our l one of our largest uh, um, uh, contributions to the renewable energy push in Turkey in the last uh, three, four years. 125 million, so more than 60% of the facility is earmarked for green climate finance investments. And also, uh, we have very importantly contributed to the private capital mobilization of up to $228 million. This is done through the mobilization of private capital. We are investing indirectly in the private sector through this facility. It's a bit counterintuitive because we are working with, uh, with a sovereign back facility, but the target is the private sector. It's the IPP market, it's the different uh, private agents that can uh, be mobilized and support uh, the energy transition of Turkey. But uh, enough of hearing from me. I think it's a good opportunity to give the word to our uh, client who is uh, today in our panel. And thank you very much for joining us, uh, Selene. Uh, over to you. Uh, just to um, uh, fully introduce uh, Selene Antman. She's the Manager, Development, Finance, Institutions Department at the Industrial Development Bank of Turkey. And um, just uh, how is TSKB positioning its strategy and roadmap in Turkey regarding climate finance. Um, and uh, what are the m important milestones that you've had with AIB and TSK Corporation? And what is it like working with AIB <laughs> on this particular topic area and focusing on climate together? Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to say it's so nice to be here uh, in the joint MDB pavilion in the COP27. And uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Francisco, and for all AIB colleagues for inviting us as a case study to this event. Uh, so for the ones who do not know us, so I will just like to uh, briefly talk about uh, what is TSKB is doing and its uh, sustainability and uh, climate strategy. And I would like to go through with the uh, TSKB and AIB cooperation and what's our side and what's, what are the lessons learned from our side. So uh, TSKB is founded in 1950 uh, with the support of World Bank and uh, with the mission to finance uh, medium to long term investments in Turkey. Uh, and TSKB also the first privately owned uh, investment and development bank, uh, maybe, yes, okay. Uh, in Turkey. Uh, we offer a wide range of uh, products and services, uh, for example, corporate banking, that is the business as usual, uh, direct lending uh, activities, uh, the other one is investment banking, and we offer uh, consultancy services uh, with our um, technical and research teams. So our main funding sources uh, for green and sustainable financing are the long-term uh, thematic funds, which we uh, are obtaining from the MDBs and the DFIs like uh, AIB and World Bank. We're also working with EIB, KFW, so we have uh, an expertise uh, in there. Uh, and apart from the DFI lending cooperation, we are also coordinating with the DFIs in uh, different uh, mission clubs, actually. 
uh, like for example IDFC, uh, the International Development Finance Club, they have also a pavilion in the blue zone in here. Uh, so with this close contact, we have a chance to uh, increase our capacity uh, and follow the studies of the DFIs and their agenda actually. Um, in addition, as Francisco mentioned, uh, because of our mandate, uh, we are working in a, in a close relationship with the Minister of Treasury and Finance. Uh, we are accessing the, the sovereign back loans, as in the case with AIB. Uh, so as you may see from the, the flow charts, uh, we are gathering funds uh, in different teams such as renewable energy, energy efficiency, inclusiveness, gender, uh, in line with our mission. And we provide these loans to the clients and uh, according to their uh, investment needs. So as a side note, uh, the SDG linked loans in uh, TSKB's portfolio accounts for 93% currently, and uh, more than 40% consists of electricity generation, and 93% of this electricity generation is uh, renewable energy. So uh, coming from its mission, banking practice, we have built our sustainable banking strategy. You can see it in the, uh, in the lower back. Uh, we are supporting sustainable development in Turkey. We have three key pillars. Uh, first one is sustainable development, and uh, the second one is playing an active role in combating to climate change, and the third one is uh, contributing to the low carbon transition of Turkey. So, uh, in line with our sustainability and climate change mitigation and adaptation mission, we have also financing targets. Uh, you may see them in the, in the right hand side of the slides. So, uh, for example, by 2030, we commit to finance $8 billion for SDG-linked financing. And uh, we have also committed to keep the climate-related SDG-linked loans in our loan portfolio at uh, 60%. And as I have mentioned, uh, the SDG-linked loans in our portfolio are currently 93 level uh, percent. And by 2025, we commit to keep the SDG-linked loans by 90%. So this is our... Uh, targets and actually we have uh, announced these targets within our TCFD aligned climate risk report that we have published last year. So uh, what are the important milestones for us to working with AIB and what we have learned uh, from the uh, AIB project? So um, maybe, yes. So we ha are working with AIB since 2018. Uh, and we have signed our first loan agreement in 2018 in the amount of $200 million uh, with the, the Sustainable Energy and Infrastructure on Lending Facility. Uh, as Francisco said, this project is unique, both TSKB and AIB, because uh, this is the first financial intermediary, a file loan to a bank. Uh, and the objective of this project is to advance uh, Turkey's infrastructure by primarily uh, investing renewable energy and energy efficiency. This loan is currently fully allocated and fully dispersed, and we have supported eight projects. Uh, six of them is renewable energy, uh, primarily uh, wind power plants, and one of them is energy efficiency, and the one of them is electricity distribution. So as I have mentioned in my previous slide, this project is fully aligned with TSKB strategy and also aligned with uh, AIB's uh, thematic priorities. So uh, what are the lessons learned from TSKB side? Maybe I can mention. First of all, all the projects are compliant with the uh, ENS standards of AIB. And we have been conducted financial and technical evaluation for each sub loans. Uh, along the way, uh, AIB project team has always gives feedbacks and support us uh, in order to improve our ENS uh, due diligence. And over time, we have improved our ENS capacity and documentation and we have also in a close communication with the AIB team and this enabled us to get up-to-date expertise and uh, this of course a like a positive contribution to the implementation of the project therefore uh, increasing the institutional capacity uh, is the most important game for the TSKB side so in addition to the sustainable energy and infrastructure facility, uh, AIB expanded COVID-19 uh, recovery funds in order to uh, contribute to inclusive and sustainable development. Uh, this loan signed in 19 uh, 2020 
in the amount of 200 million dollars. This is actually a recovery uh, support facility uh, to supporting the, the Turkish companies uh, who are working capital, uh, working capital needs. So with this loan we have supported 28 projects, uh, 28 companies uh, in various sectors. And internally, uh, for the most important part of this facility actually, we have expanded our ENS risk management approach and we have included working capital loans uh, in addition to investment loans. So before that, we are uh, making ENS risk management to our investment loans, but after AIB's uh, approach, we started to do uh, ENS risk management for all the working capital loans within TSKB. Uh, so, as I have mentioned, after the, the successful implementation of the, the phase one, uh, currently, uh, actually, we are working with AIB uh, to, as a continuation of the first loan, uh, we are working with uh, uh, the second phase of the, the, the first phase. So, th the, this project is aimed to finance the investment in climate mitigation and uh, adaptation and also infrastructure and other productive sectors like clean uh, industries. Uh, there are several project teams within this project, like renewable energy uh, from the mitigation side and energy efficiency, and also we will finance climate adaptation. Uh, climate adaptation projects are quite important for us because we would like to increase our capacity uh, on adaptation projects also. Therefore, we can say that this project, the new project is 100% uh, climate finance. Uh, this project is also uh, contributing to Turkey's climate mitigation and adaptation goals in line with the Paris Agreement and uh, again TSKB's climate strategy uh, and financing targets. So we hope we can finalize this project in a very short time. So thank you very much. Thank you. T today is supposed to be about uh, showing exactly what we're trying to do on the ground together with uh, our clients. So I wanted to thank the speakers for showcasing what they've uh, been working on and what we've been able to uh, move forward with um, and what we're trying to do in this uh, space of um, climate change. What's uh, interesting here is that in each MDB, you will have a, the climate team and you will have our counterparts who are in the working groups about aligning, pa doing Paris alignment, climate finance uh, uh, tracking, and we use these common methodological frameworks uh, in order to make sure that we in ensure certain standards. Um, so um, we'll continue at AIB to try to learn and advance and um, we uh, welcome all engagement of all stakeholders in this uh, endeavor to, for implementation. And what we're trying to do is advance on the implementation part uh, together with the investment team. Again, we need to make sure that um, we're doing this in uh, a way that is engaging to come to solutions together that address a, a broad sway of, of uh, um, issues. Uh, to the point that uh, AIB not only signed up to Paris alignment and, and uh, the commitment on climate finance, we also signed up to uh, the nature uh, positive statement from COP26, nature-based solutions work within the bank is, is continuing and we're also trying to make sure that we address that. When we're looking at uh, uh, activities in the bank, we're trying to take a wholesome approach um, as well because we are there to work with our clients on what their needs are, what their pathways are, and uh, that's really the spirit in which uh, AIB investment officers are engaging with the clients. Um, uh, at um, uh, uh, COP, we were able to ad advance with a a few um, aspects, and this is what I wanted to leave you with in terms of particular actions that we were able to, to take. Um, so I had grouped right at the beginning the three main areas that we came to COP27 with, which is mob uh, mobilizing finance um, and also working with partners uh, to do that, and also um, 
uh, focusing on technology as a key solution, and finally, adaptation and resilience. And uh, here you'll see that uh, we've been able to respond to client needs uh, as uh, quickly as possible by supporting uh, Pakistan's uh, building resilience program called BRACE program. We were able to contribute to, uh, to that and we signed that here in the Pakistan pavilion. And also in the investment side in the second uh, stage of the Alcazar energy uh, investment, we were able to uh, sign that also here and the fund was closed here together with partners. As, as my colleagues have been talking about working with partners, that's an important aspect. So those are the, the direct investments that we were able to make into programs and to funds. And what we were also able to do is to join uh, the, the national efforts here in Egypt on the Nawefi partnership agreement. And we, were, we did that on the 8th of November in the, in the evening together with um, other MDBs. The, the two funds that Toshi Fumi was talking about are the Energy Transition Accelerator Financing Platform that IRENA is hosting. And the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development provided the initial uh, anchor funding. And we've also contributed 300 million to that. That will be to support renewable energy projects that are coming from IRENA members, but also from any stakeholder. And NGOs can submit to that. It's an open platform, open throughout the year. Um, so that's an interesting partnership. And the other one is with the Global Energy Alliance for People and Profit. Uh, and that particularly is distinct from the others because it's a philanthropic association that we are engaging with on that. And it's going to bring different types of capital into supporting uh, uh, socially driven projects. And then finally, in terms of partnerships, we also supported the Green Hydrogen Organization publication to make sure that their standards are, are kept. So it's more about making sure that green hydrogen is done properly and the scale up is done properly. Um, so, and finally, on the capital markets, we supported and have joined the, the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, and that uh, is about pricing climate risk and making sure that uh, we're, we're able to do that in a, in a uh, way that is uh, transparent and methodologically works well. And what, we're, what it would do is potentially create a paradigm shift if we're able to price that appropriately, that then goes into investment decision making. Um, and uh, uh, finally, I'm, I can't even read the, the thing. Yes, I just wanted to say, we have, and, and you've heard our vice president uh, as well, uh, Sir Danny Alexander mentioned this, that we have a plan for a resilience bond to be issued in 2023, uh, the basis of which would be the cl climate resilience activities that we've been doing. So I, I wanted to thank the panel for bringing out some specific examples, their direct investment examples, results-based lending, partnerships in the transport sector, both climate resilience and mitigation aspects, and then the financial intermediary work and really trying to make sure that we scale up our action on mitigation and adaptation and work with clients to keep to um, high standards and continue to build on that. And it's uh, great to see that you've been able to apply certain aspects to across your uh, portfolio of investments. So now I'll ask for the uh, live stream to be uh, stopped. Uh, and I'd like to open up to um, questions and answers. We're, we're here for, uh, asking, uh, for answering any questions that you may have. Uh, so we have four people from our investment operations team, strategy, 